Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing local journalism and the challenges it faces, including a rapidly changing media landscape, the spread of disinformation and eroding trust in media, and even assaults on press freedom. We're going to talk about all this today with our special guest, Stephanie Campbell, CEO of the nonprofit Kansas City Beacon, and Eric Meyer, editor and publisher of the for-profit Marion County Record. Uh, Eric, Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy to have you here and so honored to be part of this dialogue that that you advance in your daily lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so for having us. I'm going to set this up and we're going to go to you, Stephanie, um, just by citing UNC School of Journalism and Media uh, 2020 report that a quarter of the nation's newspaper vanished in recent years, just folded, um, with almost 2,100 uh, papers lost since 2004. And Northwestern's journalism school reports that 20% of Americans live in what they characterize as local news deserts. Digital media is viewed as key to saving these news organizations, but you also see the risk of massive consolidation in which major corporations purchase up brands and then create kind of an echo chamber of of centrally controlled messaging that goes out and uh, sometimes masquerading as, as news. So you're you're both kind of at the forefront of this struggle. So Stephanie, let's talk about the Beacon as an online only news organization launched in 2020 serving Kansas City and Wichita. How do you see the digital media model? How do you see journalism uh, developing? And then, Eric, if you could uh, jump in in terms of of how you see what you've seen through your family's long ownership of the Marion County record and what you've just experienced, uh, that would be great. Uh, Stephanie, could you take us off? Sure. I I think we represent very different perspectives in that, but we're still in alignment that both are so critically important to the future of journalism and the news and information landscape in this country. Specifically for context, Eric is in a rural community right in between the two main communities that we serve at The Beacon. So The Beacon is a digital publication that's about three years old. We're a nonprofit business model, and we have public service newsrooms based in Kansas City and in Chita. Eric's organization sits a little bit northeast of us in a rural community, and I'll let let him speak to that. We are new and digital, and our idea is to recreate the future of news and information systems in the context of the landscape that I think you painted very accurately. We have a major decline in journalism across the country. Uh, The the middle of the map here is no different. We're we're suffering alongside our our American peers. And then combined with that, there's a proliferation of misinformation and disinformation exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So the Beacon was born to meet an immediate need and respond to how do we filter through all of this information, this proliferation of of information, I think some well-intentioned, some not, but folks really looking for what is the critical information we need right now in the moment of a pandemic. And I think we saw that that information was was hard to find and then and then hard to fact check. So what we're really trying to do at the Beacon is build the trustworthy information source of the future that will really serve uh, serve our readers over the long term. We're not quite there yet, but we're committed to building it in a way that's more inclusive, perhaps, than the uh, information monoliths and legacy generations of the past. And you have a face, right, Eric? You have a personality. You have a door you can knock on. People know you. That is so important when we're being inundated by anonymized stuff. We can't really evaluate it. There's no, there's no name connected to it. That's true. Uh, and, and I will 
agree with most of what Stephanie said. I'm going to disagree with some of it. Uh, I, and I will say that, that prior to my being here, I was a journalism professor at the University of Illinois. And one of the things I did there was run an online news site. I ran American Journalism Reviews magazine online and eventually sold it and actually worked as a consultant to news organizations uh, about converting to online. I don't view this as a technology thing. The, the notion that printed newspapers are, uh, are dead has gone on for, well, 1948, when my father went to journalism school, he was told that ten newspapers would be dead within 10 years. They would be replaced by, wait for it, facsimile. Fax machines were going to be in everybody's house, and they were going to get a little fax every morning telling them what the news was. Uh, it has changed but it has changed not so it has changed largely because of the advertising situation and it has changed largely because of the different retail situations uh these days there there's no such thing as as locally owned businesses hardly uh and locally owned businesses are the the lifeblood of locally owned news organizations they're the ones that advertise uh, a chain business has some massive strategy that it wants to reach out to someone who controls you know tens of thousands of news outlets at the same time so you get that homogenizing effect economically not driven by audience the other side of this that i will agree with is the is the the echo chamber cocooning of society uh starting with the cable news talking heads at night who think they're journalists who aren't uh and continuing on to what I recall is the greatest evil of all this antisocial media or social media, as it's called, uh, which allows you to exist in this little private world that only the viewpoints that you want are the ones that you hear. Now, what's the answer to all that? I don't know. Uh, I, there's a lot of promise in in the idea of nonprofit newsrooms. I mean, we would be probably in a different state today if it weren't for the Kansas Reflector, which is a not-for-profit news organization that picked up the story of our raid uh, as one of the first places that did so. On the other hand, a lot of these organizations are very beholden to who their donors are. They have very particular causes, and those causes are very likely to be more than local. What my belief is, is that there's a real market for local community news in great depth. Uh, we we still cover, if an ambulance goes out in this town, we know where it went. If a fire truck went out, we know where it went. We go out and produce all that. If any crime that's committed, anybody that's arrested, we talk about those people. This is time consuming. It's costly to do this kind of coverage. Um, but it gives you the basis for things. Sometimes if you've got everyone looking at the the 30,000 foot view of the world, the big issues, we're talking about Hamas and Ukraine and the speaker's race and on and on and on and on and on. Uh, you lose track of extremely important things that actually do affect people's lives in a local community. So the more insular a community is, and Stephanie described it nicely that we're halfway between uh, Kansas City and Wichita, but actually the truth is we're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> I used to tell people, uh, they say, oh, you're from Kansas. Where in Kansas? And I said, if you know of any place, it's at least 60 miles from there. And if you're really good, it's 30 miles from there. Uh, we're on the boundaries of old area codes right across the middle of our county. We're in three different sectional centers for the Postal Service. Uh, we're in two different TV markets. Uh, we just don't have a local news that covers us. We can't, we can get, you can get an online source, but the only newspaper that delivers in this in this community is the Salina Journal. And we don't the county doesn't focus towards Salina except for one very small tier at the northern part of the county. So if there's information to be provided about what goes on in this county, it's us or nobody. And, and the thing that, that really struck me, Eric, as as I read, you know, after the raid, and we're gonna we're gonna give you a, a moment to just uh describe uh what transpired for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, the thing that really struck me is that it seemed to me that you almost had this way of living. There's this, this series of values, which is 
to report, to do the duty of reporting what, what was going on in the area, to do the thorough investigation, right, to look at fact without fear or favor, and to provide your take on it. Doesn't mean that you have revealed knowledge or you have uh, necessarily special insight, but the thoroughness with which your reporting uh, was done and, and that you pursued the truth as you could discover it was really, really interesting to us because it seems to me that what what now goes on as as journalism too often has is nothing of the sort. Facts are are given short shrifts. Uh, opinions, various opinions or or events or celebrity or whatever it is, is being given equal weight with with the boring stuff. And it seems to me that, or at least my impression was, is that you were you were after what you could find. Exactly. Uh, not only what we could find, but what we thought is interesting. You know, the, the, the biggest challenge of journalism is to make the dull things that are important interesting to the readers. You have to put a human face on them. You have to you have to somehow or other explain why you care about this. And great changes can happen in society. Uh, what if you put a human face on an issue, if you don't put a human face on an issue, if you make people believe that it just it moves on and it's just there and there's nothing they can do about it. And it goes on. They stop looking for facts. This is, this is, I, I don't want to sound too college professory uh, right here, but there, there's a, there's a thing called heuristic systematic modeling of persuasion theory. And basically what it says is that if you don't believe that you have control of anything, that you stop looking for systematic analysis of facts and you instead go with the slogans. You go with the, you know, and I don't want to get this into political sides, but, you know, build that wall or or uh, living wage. Uh, let's go on both sides of this. Everything, everything has a slogan somewhere that goes with it. And you don't look at it. Now, where society has changed, you know, we're here in Kansas and Kansas voted against the value them both amendment, which basically allowed reproductive freedom to remain a, a right in the state of Kansas. This is about as red a state as you're going to get. Uh, but it but it did that. And it did that because the people here have managed to know people who have faced these situations and have related to them. They understand it. They they can humanize it. It's not a slogan anymore. Uh, all the other things about whether Biden's coming to get your guns or or Obama was born in in Africa or whatever else that you have to come up with, uh, or uh, even whether we ought to have the the sides in the Isra the current dispute between Israel and and the Hamas and Gaza and so on they're so diffuse that people don't look at facts anymore they but look when you at know somebody when you know somebody when you when you actually have a face that actually creates the connection Stephanie do you feel that the the difference that the Kansas City Beacon represents of being an online it, it is is the only difference the fact that you're online are the values that you're espousing that you're trying to advance um the same um as as those that that Eric were describing in terms of being a news reporting organization with a local focus absolutely absolutely I think right now there are two ideas of thought that, Digital access is either a uh, a privilege, something to be earned, a resource that you know, perhaps capitalists can yeah. control. And rather, I subscribe to the idea that digital access is a commodity. It's water, it's electricity, it's it's critical for our communities. And if you subscribe to the idea that digital access is a commodity, it's also a pivotal tool around which all members of society need to connect with with their communities. We at the Beacon, I don't believe that there's one entity that's going to meet every individual's needs. We need to build up a robust ecosystem of quite a few different players in the news and information space 
that are all all playing together and playing different parts, like a symphony of of news and information. In Kansas City, we have a metro population, you know, north of two million people. The idea that one publication is going to meet the needs of all of those folks, I think, is short sighted. So the Kansas City Beacon, the Wichita Beacon are our state house reporters that live in both state houses and then our reporters that are serving more rural communities. Each one of those is bringing to us a key constituent whose who's needs they're trying to meet. We also work really closely with other like-minded entities in both of the markets that we serve as part of what we think are pretty new and innovative media collectives. This includes you know, the PBS, the NPR outlets, and even the local libraries that are taking on a bigger and bigger role and are also uh, under attack in in this moment in American history. Well, let's so talk I, I think the uh, tenants or beliefs are, are all of the same, and it's just a new and innovative way and, and an additional channel that we can use to meet people where they are. There's one key difference between the channels. Uh, with online, you have to go get it. it it's, it's a pull medium. You have, to, you have to go pull the things out you want. This is one of the things that everybody's trying to do. One of the reasons they've got apps and everything else is to push it towards you so that you'll encounter it every day the way you used to stumble across a newspaper on your doorstep or on a newsstand somewhere. Uh, it hasn't been figured out completely. And one of the problems is the people who control the push capability tend to be those people that Stephanie was talking about, that I was talking about, that you don't necessarily want to have into this. They figured out they can make money out of segmenting the population rather than uniting the population. Uh, you know, we're not foolish enough to believe that everything we cover is going to cause unity in among our readers. It may cause disunity for a period of time, but hopefully it will provide a civil disunity that results in a common acceptance at some point. That's not what people want who are marketing this stuff. They want to get a fragmented society, a stratified society that they know they can appeal to different groups that have different opinions. And they don't want them to change those opinions. They don't want them to, to learn different things. They don't want them to be interested in other things. Uh, one of the challenges of, of not-for-profits is that very often the people who come into these also have a particular point of view. Uh, I I know it's naive to say it because every journalist has a bias, but truth of the matter is I don't care what they do. I, I really don't. I just want to make sure that they have the information that they make a decision. And I hope, you know, sort, sort of being Thomas Jefferson here, that if given enough, just enough information, people will arrive at the right conclusion. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Sometimes they don't. Uh, and I feel sad about that, but it's still my job to give it to them and their job to figure out what to do with it. I love your your statement, civil disunity, right? A, a civilized disunity. In other words, we we all can have different views, but we need to mix it up. We need to be willing to relay our our uh, different views and argue them them through. I'd like to, Eric, um, have you just sort of recount what I've heard in a number of you know, 27 second segments of, of <laughs> what you experienced from your your investigations that resulted in the police chief um, engaging in a raid on, on you. And then let's talk about what's going on here in the United States, because this whole idea of suppressing voices is really gaining traction and also attacking voices when they're different from yours. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what you experienced and an attempt to suppress your voice because of what your voice was was saying because of your speech, which yeah. is an anti-American act. And 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 our, the evidence as we as we uncover more and more stuff is is pointing more in that direction. The, the initial thought we had was that this had to do with the, the chief wanting to discover some damaging information that we had on him. We don't think that's true anymore. He did look at it, but we don't think that's what happened. We think what happened was they targeted us in particular because they regarded us as negative. Uh, and the 
Every journalist in the world has been accused of being negative and of saying fake news. Uh, but anytime you anytime you purvey something that is contrary to what someone would like to have happen, uh, it's negative. Now, I tend to say, you know, this is like you're 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 talking to your best friend who's heading out on a job interview or a date. and They've got a piece of spinach stuck in their teeth. And you, you don't you, when they ask you, how do I look? You don't want to say great, fabulous. You want to say, hey, you got a piece of spinach cut and you're stuck in your teeth. Take it out. So there, there's something advantageous to the to the society of pointing out problems. But a lot of people don't believe that way. Uh, this is, and a lot of people don't care about facts and uh, a fair amount of this is attributable to the recent sort of populist movements and the idea that, that facts don't matter and beliefs do, uh, and, and you can go on with that. But what happened was we obtained a, from a source, a document that indicated that a local restaurateur, uh, was driving illegally. And we looked into it. We didn't want to be Dan Rathered. So we verified that this was actually a legitimate document. And uh, then we found out that it was just a dispute between her and her estranged husband over who got to keep their cars uh, in a divorce settlement. So we said, there's no way we're going to do this. But the person who'd given it to us told us uh, that she'd gotten it through connections and that the police were ignoring that this woman had been driving for 12 years without a license. So I forwarded it to the sheriff and the police chief with an offer of saying, we don't think there's anything to this, but if you do, you know, give us a call. We'll see what we can do. They never call. They immediately upon seeing this and, and some of the documents that we've come up with later on uh, verify this is they just jumped on it immediately. They jumped on it to me personally. And said, well, he may not have stolen it, but this is a stolen document and he knew about it and he could have done it. He could be accessory to the thing. Let's figure out how to find him and charge him with something. And meanwhile, the mayor, uh, the vice mayor, who is a political opponent of the mayor, had also received from the same source the same information and had disclosed it at the same time. Disclosed who she got it from. We didn't disclose our source, but it was the same person. Uh, she'd pointed that out. The city administrator said, because they were going, the woman was going through a liquor license at the time, let's not deal with this. Let's let the state deal with it. And it was all going to lie there. Suddenly, somewhere, a day after that, when they found out that the newspaper was also involved, and then the vice mayor was also involved. And, oh, gee, amazingly, those are the two main political enemies in the Richard Nixon enemies list style of enemies that the mayor had. And all of a sudden, we are under investigation and attack. And not only attack, not only minor investigation, they took the entire police force and raided, did simultaneous raids on my and my mother's house, the newspaper office, the vice mayor's house. Uh, there were seven people standing in the family room of my mother, my 98 year old mother, waiting to search for her computer for almost two and a half hours. If this isn't intimidation, I don't know what it is. No, oh, by the way, two of the sheriff's deputies who were part of that raid have now resigned their positions, citing this raid as part of the reason why. Uh, a lot of law enforcement people are among the people we've heard from tens of thousands of people nationwide about how awful this was among the, the, the disproportionate number of them are law enforcement officers uh, who have said, you know, everybody should know better than this. My mother was very upset. Uh, she kept telling them that this was going to be the death of her, that she was going to have a heart attack and die. And sure enough, the next day she did. Uh, and, uh, I think that that we talked earlier about the human face on stories. That was the human face on our story yeah. was her and her standing up and, you know, get out of my house. You're a bunch of assholes and you're a bunch of Gestapo Nazis and whatever else she was saying at 98. Now, one of the officers after action reports tried to persuade, tried to portray her as as uh demented having having dementia that she didn't know what was going on i think if you listen to the video she knew what was going on very clearly and she was pissed about it uh and uh it we eventually come down to the fact that the the county attorney who mysteriously did or didn't look at the warrants and the judge who also 
also uh, notarized the affidavit, and then he didn't have the affidavit when we wanted it. Anyway, it all got withdrawn in a couple of days, uh, and our equipment came back. But, of course, it was after we'd had to put out a newspaper without most of our computers. We're still struggling to recover things that we had. But, you know, when you put out a newspaper, you have, you know, the the, the nameplate that you have. We didn't have that. <laughs> It was on it was on our server and it was on our backup hard drive. And it was also on DVDs that we'd had it backup. They took our server, they took our backup hard drive, and they took every computer that had a DVD player on it. So it took us a while to find even the simplest of things that we could do to publish. We did. We got out our normal deadlines midnight. We got out at 530 that morning. Uh, and the Hutchinson News, which uh, uh, is... Uh, a chain owned operation gave us priority and printed us early. So we actually got out in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, but uh, uh, it has been a mess since then. The police chief who, whose only defense was nobody ever told me I couldn't do this. Uh, took him six weeks to suspend him. And then he quit right after that. Uh, we still have a KBI investigation that's still pending, even though the way the thing we were accused of was getting this document and they found that we did access it. But we accessed it several days after the copy they had in their hands, which they never investigated how it came to, into being. Uh, and it was actually sitting right here on my desk uh, when they raided and they didn't take it. <laughs> They took my well, computer. It just, it just seems here, that it, take it. it speaks to this this objective of suppressing voice. Stephanie, how do you view these kinds of of acts? I, and you know, I see what's going on here, and some of the threats that went on in the speaker's um, uh, nomination, the speaker of the House of Representatives nomination. Those, those kinds of threats. You know, how dare you stand up and vote differently? Um, I see a connection between um, what's going on in our education system to say that there's only one version of American history that can be taught. I see this whole idea of trying to control what people see, which is, Eric, essentially what was going on, right? Control what people see. How dare you let people see things or be exposed to things that we don't want them to be exposed to or see? Stephanie, how do you see this? Yeah, it, it's part of a really scary trend. And honestly, that's that's why I'm here. That's why I have found myself in journalism. I think this is a, a critical challenge facing my generation. I'm I'm just shy of 40. And this is what I'm thinking about as as people my age start to take leadership positions and important roles across this country. I think we're seeing attacks on independent journalism that's limiting the voices of the people. I think we're seeing um, movements to create singly focused narratives that say there's only one way to teach certain things in our schools. We're seeing threats to Congress if they're not voting certain ways. Uh, we see politicians having one conversation in public and we hear recordings of having them having entirely different conversations <laughs> in private. And for all of these reasons, people my age and younger are choosing to check out and tune out and they're falling down rabbit holes and TikTok and they're binge drinking at higher rates. They have higher rates of anxiety and depression. Uh, they're feeling hopeless. And there is a decline in trust in, in local news. And people like, like Eric and people like myself have our hands tied up between, you know, with an overly litigious society, I would say as well. Uh, we have our hands tied up with things that I think are distractions that don't necessarily allow us all of the freedom and latitude to be able to to stay in the fight. And sometimes I think these things are on purpose, not necessarily attacks against institution like mine specifically, but in general, we're seeing more of them. We're also seeing increased public information requests and longer lag times between when we are able to actually secure the results of those public information requests. I think that's a combination of things. I think too often we're blaming um, uh, 
folks with nefarious intentions that are are withholding information from us. But I also think there's more technology, more video, literally more megabytes that are living on storage. And it's just a harder thing to do to deliver on public information requests today. But either way, the idea that we aren't keeping up with the ability to make information available to citizens that by law they have a right to have is incredibly concerning and we need to do better. And I think that's why a lot of new movers in the nonprofit space are entering into this landscape to be a part of the solution. Is part of the your point, Stephanie, that we have, uh, it was very interesting to hear you draw uh, a connection between addiction, for example, and hopelessness of not being able to to uh, express yourself or or find the truth or... Uh, the fact that information seems to be increasingly distant, true information, and trust is eroding. Do you see a link between fundamental values of integrity, searching for truth, truth telling? In other words, not saying one thing in a closed door meeting and another thing, you know, in public. The whole idea of of using your your media presence in order to make money as opposed to talk about facts, right? Do you connect all these different dots? And if so, then does that contextualize the disappearance of 2,100 newspapers in, the, in recent years where there are just fewer opinions and fewer people to advance the values that, Eric, you described as being core to your pursuit as a journalist? Well, I think the, the one thing that you want to think about is that this is a generation that, unlike prior generations, you know, my generation, I'm, I'm still baby boom here, and we were our desire was to to stand out, not fit in. I, I think the 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 Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z group is more wanting, particularly the Gen Y and Gen Z, are are more likely to want to fit in. You know, they're Barney the dinosaur. I love you. You love me. Let's all be happy. Let's don't ever don't anybody worry about any of these things. I want to be your neighbor from Mister Rogers. Everything is everything is calm and and let's don't make waves. Let's don't let's don't rock things. Let's just worry about our life and let's get on our boat and let's barbecue in our backyard and let's have our kids all be honor roll students and all the students are above average, like well begone days, uh, whatever else. And, and they don't come forward. And the result is essentially a lack of leadership. And when there's a lack of leadership, there are always people who are willing to step into a leadership vacuum. And those usually are the wrong people. Uh, the wrong people come in and, and, and try to exist in that leadership vacuum. And the only way to get fix this is to make people look at facts, look at actual information and express their opinions. It's not just that we aren't listening. We're doing plenty of listening. We listen to all sorts of divergent opinions. Uh, we don't really seriously listen to them. We listen to them and then go home and say, oh, so -and -so I did this. You know, I mean, it's, it's the old, uh, you know, listen to the, the locker room after you've gone to the uh, the the uh, sensitivity training class and in a business world. And, and the, you go into the locker room with the guys and they say the same things that they were always saying that they just heard not to say in the sensitivity training portion. Uh, so that two facedness is always there. I worked in politics back in the 70s at one point, And, you know, politicians said things when they weren't on the stump that they wouldn't say if they were on the stump, not to the extent that they're doing now, uh, not to the fundamentalist attempt that they are now that they're trying to portray themselves as something completely different than what they actually are. But the notion of individual people speaking up about what they care about, why they do it, voicing their opinions and not being afraid of the backlash. And part of this is that instantaneous backlash that can come off of anti-social media. You express an idea that's a little different than what somebody else has who's in your group, and you just get flamed like you wouldn't believe. Uh, and this is even on, you know, old old fogey mom and dad Facebook, and, and you don't have to be on X or on TikTok or something like that. And people around here have never heard of those things, so it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I was interviewed by somebody once 
when during the middle of this, they said, we want to do the TikToks. And we said, oh, good. I can say whatever I want to that no one in town will ever hear because no one <laughs> in town will listen to TikTok. Uh, but uh, um, th this is convincing people that they're, it's safe to speak uh, and and giving them that voice and making sure we cast a wide enough net. And that's one of the big problems right now. You know, Stephanie's got a great news organization, but you have barely more reporters than we do uh, to cover Kansas City and Wichita. Uh, we, we've, we don't have the type of numbers that we used to have. And that's where those really interesting stories used to come from. When I was in college at the University of Kansas and I was campus editor of the paper and later editor in chief, as campus editor, I had 75 reporters you don't know what kind of stuff you can go after if you've got 75 reporters. So we covered the Lawrence School Board, which we didn't care about at all. But we found a really interesting story that involved university personnel that were abusing kids in a behavior analysis Head Start program that ended up being a major story that we would never have found if we hadn't been covering the Lawrence School Board, which we had no intention of running anything about the Lawrence School Board for. That's the kind of wide net. When I was at the Milwaukee Journal, we had 350 people in our newsroom, and we were competing with a newspaper we also own, the Milwaukee Sentinel, which had 190. So 190 and 350, they've combined, and now they're down to about 70 for the yeah, total of the two of them. The numbers, you, the numbers are gonna, compelling. You're going to miss things that way. The the, yeah. the notion of casting this extremely wide net, looking at everything. Uh, the guy who wrote The Wire did this on John Oliver's show and talked about how covering the, the Baltimore sewerage district meetings was an important aspect of, of protecting society <laughs> because – you never know what's going to come out of those meetings and nobody can do that now. We don't, the money isn't there. If you, if you go with an online only publication, you're, you're hugely scaled down from what you can do with a print publication. So uh, Stephanie, um, we're going to give you the final word on how do we solve the problem that Eric just so articulately, the whole issue of resource, how do we deal with this? Because there are some advantages to the nonprofit um, model. And there are also some advantages to cooperation, partnering. There are some advantages to not having to create a physical distribution. I mean, those the printing co is costly and the distribution of printed material is, is costly, whereas your model is essentially free in terms of distributing. We'll give you the last word. What should we all be doing? What should I be doing? What should Eric be doing? to solve the, these uh, these big issues? Yeah, so I'm newer to the journalism space, but also also went to the KUJ school, journalism school, so rock, rock shock. Um, <laughs> I, I feel and I find the biggest surprise to me coming into this sector is how unaware those outside of the sector are of the problem that we're facing. And I think that is the single largest challenge ahead of us. Those who have been in the sector for decades have been experiencing this, and it's somewhat akin to the frog in the boiling water. You know, uh, one day we woke up and, oh, my goodness, the water was boiling. Um for folks outside of this space, folks who give millions of dollars to the fine and performing arts, integral integral sectors of society that I have worked in in the past and also believe are critical, are in shock learning about the deep, deep decline of news and information in this country. Uh, in, in Kansas City, I, I searched the other day and saw there are only two reporters in the entire city that cover education specifically as a beat. Two. This yet I I shudder to think how many uh British British royalty correspondents we <laughs> <laughs> we may have in, in this marketplace uh who who are following those types of types of topics, right? Um we've got 
T Swift and Travis Kelsey news radiating from from the Midwest, but this giant vacuum of news and information. So step one is the biggest problem is people don't know we have a problem. We have eroding trust in institutions that have been viewed as trustworthy by the general population for hundreds of years. That's that's a new and, and challenging problem. So we need to not only educate that there is a problem, we also need to build trust in places that we hadn't traditionally needed to communicate and prove are trustworthy or worthy of our trust. And then aside from that, we have to address the problems that are inherent in the system that exists. And that is that the systems that are currently broken were imperfect. And that's because they were designed with a different priority. It was about reaching the people as a tool for profit. And we look at revenue as a nonprofit model. We look at revenue as a tool to reach and impact the people, which is an inherently different paradigm. Now, some someone like the Marion County Register is going to serve the population. That's not in question. I think that's that's inherent in a in a smaller town community. It isn't necessarily the case in some of our our bigger metropolitan areas. And there are giant populations of of people who identify in many different ways it, with identities that have been left behind by traditional media. Uh, black and brown people, non-citizens, uh, women, young people. There are a lot of groups who have been disserved by traditional media. And I think a huge opportunity ahead of us is to take this moment as an opportunity to rebuild and to so innovate. The, and the, answer what is, the answer is to invest more, find a way, find the revenue streams, invest more, expand coverage, and most importantly, let's get citizens involved. Let's let's get people interested, right? I mean, let's if there's- Let's go back to the early days when, when newspapers were originally founded. You know, William Rockhill Nelson, uh, Colonel McCormick, uh, Lucius Neiman in Milwaukee, you know, the, the, all these people, the way this newspaper here in town was founded was that they wanted a newspaper. And there was a little town by the name of Detroit uh, that was in a, a war with Abilene uh, over who was going to be the county seat of Dickinson County. And Detroit lost. Detroit is now a ghost town. But there was a newspaper there. And the people in Marion, which was at that time called Marion Center, went up and basically bribed the guy to come down here because they thought they needed a newspaper. Not because the newspaper was going to make money there, but because they thought they needed a newspaper. And a lot of the people who originally started newspapers, now you've got the William Randolph Hearsts, and we'll we'll ignore them for a while. But prior to the prior to that, most of the people who started most of these newspapers did so not as an investment that was going to make tons of money. They started it because it was their community and they wanted to do something good for their community. And that's what we need to get back to. Uh, and to an extent, good for it's the community own. good for the country, right? Right, good Eric. For the community good for the country, and and once you get enough money in your portfolio, you don't need to worry about making money off of the rest of it anymore. So, you know, we used to have a saying around Milwaukee when we were going there that we good congratulations, we made a record thirty two percent profit on sales last last month, but it was five points below goal. And we've got to cut our spending so that we can get up to 35% or 36% or whatever. All we need to do is think, is, can we can we continue in the business? Can we break even? Can we be nonprofit, uh, whether we technically are or not? Uh, but the profit is that we're going to elevate all the boats around us. Uh, and can we can we serve our place. local communities? Can we serve our local towns? Can we serve whether the local town is Los Angeles or New York or Marion County or anywhere else in the United States? There's nobody who's a flyover. I'd like to really thank you, Stephanie Campbell, CEO of the nonprofit Kansas City Beacon, and Eric Meyer, editor and publisher of the for-profit. In, in quotation marks, I guess, Marion <laughs> County uh, record and in memory of your your mother, uh, a woman of, of iron will who stood up 
when she needed to stand up. May we all follow her example and yours. Thank you so much for, for sharing your, your words with us and your thoughts. Thank you.